Dear brothers and sisters, respected guest, Dr. Shadi Shabak, my name is Ibrahim Hassan and I welcome you to tonight's program. The Muslim community is no exception to the addiction, depression, and mental health crisis that are ravaging families across the country. But when confronted with these issues, many of us may not be aware of what to do, who to go to, and what the real difficulties in addressing and overcoming these challenges are. To lend us some insight and guidance into the subject, we are very pleased to be joined by Dr. Shadi Shabak. He is a board-certified general and adolescent psychiatrist working out of his, out of his clinic, Core Psych, in Dearborn, Michigan. He also serves as the chair for the American Society for Adolescent Psychiatry, the Diversity Committee, is faculty at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, and has research interests in cultural competence. He has published several papers related to psychiatry and is a mental health advocate within the Arab and Muslim community. Please help me welcome him with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Some of the work I do within the Arab uh, and Muslim community is advocate, advocate for mental health. Um, and I also have a clinic to uh, provide resource for people who are struggling with mental illness. But I like to advocate in a way that's culturally sensitive and appropriate instead of demeaning towards the culture. So oftentimes with activism, what we see is this culture is backwards and we need to change the culture. This culture is not good. This religion um, uh, makes people feel uh, shame um, and things like that. I, I take a different approach. I believe that uh, any culture uh, has a protective factors. And the uh, Arab Muslim culture, as well as the uh, Indian subcontinent culture, as well as the Persian culture, all of these cultures within, uh, within the Islamic world have protective factors, and they should not just be tossed aside in favor of a, um, a more uh, Western positivism or individualistic culture. And I'm going to get into that. I'm going to discuss the different frameworks of culture um, and then tie it in with, uh, with religion, inshallah. Um, one of the most, uh, the recent paper I recently uh, got published in a, uh, a medical journal was uh, about the attitudes of depression, toward depression in Arab American Muslim community. Um, and it was surprising because y you, you realize that people are willing and uh, willing to get help if the help is provided. It's not like the Arab or Muslim community is somehow behind or uh, unaccepting to get help. They just, there's just, the help does not exist in a culturally appropriate manner, so it causes skepticism and mistrust. So the objectives today, we're gonna define what family means, define the major cultural frameworks with a focus on acculturation. So acculturation is extremely important, especially in immigrant communities. We're gonna discuss mental health and substance abuse outcomes in the Muslim American community, summarize the process of finding help and spotlight community resources, and critique the current state of ad activism and advocacy. And if I have time, I'll get into some history as well. So family defined. When we think of family, what do we think? But, uh, so we think of a unit. We think of almost like the smallest governing unit in a way with a mother and a father and children. So what do we call that? We call that the nuclear family. But that's not the only family structure out there. Can anyone think of other family structures out there? Sorry? So extended family, okay. In some cultures, there's no such thing as nuclear family. There's a multi-generational family. So where grandmother, grandfather, mother, father, and children live in the same household that are very close proximity. That's a unit. In some cultures, that's the essential family unit. In other uh, cultures, there's a matriarchal structure where it's mother, aunt, maternal uncle, and the father has nothing to do with, with the family. That's some, some places around the world. That's not obviously the Islamic or the or, or from our culture, but I just wanted to find that sometimes it's not as easy to say that's family, especially in psychiatry, because you have such a diverse group of people that come and see you. What other forms of family are there? There's also single, uh, single parents and things like that. So, but when we think of the traditional family, we're thinking of the, when we're discussing family in this talk and other talks, we're either gonna be, it's either one or two, multi-generational or nuclear. So that's what we're gonna focus on today, okay? So this is just some definitions. Uh, family is a group consisting of parents and children living together, all the descendants of a common ancestor, 
or suitable for children, family-friendly restaurant, you know, things like that. Um, in, uh, and, and, and there's been criticism by some people, some activists, about the concept of family. They want to just bring down family. They've actually discussed it in um, critical theory and other things in the university nowadays. If you're studying social sciences, you really have to have a good backbone because everything literally in social science right now is against the traditional values. Um, one of the things, uh, so, th so there's, this, there's this attack on family, and they say that the nuclear family, for example, that we discussed, is a white heteropatriarchy uh, construct that they made, they enforce on us to keep us repressed and oppressed. Now, I mean, you know, you think a little bit, you just think a, a, a few examples that it's not a new construct. It's not like from in the 50s, Eisenhower said nuclear family and then it became a thing. So can we think of families throughout history that uh, were structured this way? And as a nuclear family, so we could debunk them from our own tradition? Huh? Ahlul Bayt? That's a multi generational family? Okay. How about Adam? <laughs> the first family <laughs> was literally father, mother, and children, right? And then even if you go through history, throughout uh, ancient history, you find that the nuclear family existed as a unit. Um, throughout many of the Middle Eastern, Indian subcontinent, and European societies far before the 1950s. So that's, that's easily debunked. So it's not something created to oppress us. It's something to, to create a safety net for us so that we can have a support network, so that we can um, have uh, a form of, uh, of belonging and lineage, right? I mean, these are things that are internal to human beings. We want this. And so they exist. They wouldn't, this wouldn't exist if we didn't want it and if, if it wasn't ingrained in us. Um, now, tri there's also you know tribes and things like that, but we know that when Islam came, it kind of moved the focus from tribe to family. So family is very, very, very important, and we need to be ready to address these things on the university when someone makes an outlandish uh, comment or statement. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of uh, I've seen a lot of Arab, uh, young Arab American and young Muslims and young uh, people Daisies. Um, kind of regurgitate this stuff, but then when you actually explain it to them, they're like, oh, I didn't think of it that way. So yeah, we do have to think of it that way. We need to be very critical so that we address this stuff in the university because the wolves will come at us with sheep, sheep's clothing. So we have to really understand what we are dealing with. All right, so let's move to acculturation and I'm gonna tie, this will all tie together uh, as, the, as the presentation goes on. Has anyone heard the term acculturation before? Yes, so from a home culture or home country to a host culture, hadara ila hadara, right? So in our communities, what kind of uh, acculturation takes place? So a lot of us come from, or our families come from, cultures based on honor and shame. So honor and shame are external compasses in which we judge ourselves. Okay, so honor is ex how people view me, uh, do they view me honorably or do they view me shamefully? So that is what honor and shame cultures are. And these span quite a large portion of the world's population. Um, you would think of the Middle East, uh, you would think of, uh, again, the Indian subcontinent, I keep going back to that. Um, and you'd think a little bit in the Far East as well. Honor and shame cultures are a huge culture in the world. So this is where you want to do things, but you put every uh, you put other people's uh, perception in part of the, the decision making process. Okay, so external compass, dignity and guilt based cultures. So what's the difference between dignity and guilt and honor and shame? Dignity and guilt are internal; they're an internal compass. Okay, so this is more going to be found in uh, many of the Western civilizations. Uh, most notably Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, um, and uh, the northern states. They have, they're, they're very much based on dignity and guilt. So it's basically um, a do you type of culture. Do whatever makes you happy and don't worry about what anyone else thinks. Now that sounds good as a slogan, but you know, it doesn't, it's, it's very hard for us to apply it when we come from a different cultural standpoint. And neither one, I'm not saying our, one culture is better or, or, or worse than the other. What I'm trying to say is that 
um, we cannot just tell a whole bunch of people that follow one that are from one construct from one framework that everything you guys believe and do is wrong and you need to adapt to another one suddenly right and we could see a lot of problems with dignity and guilt cultures is if you just do you and do what makes you happy that can be problematic and that's what we see in a lot of the activism today including from our own communities then there's face based cultures so anyone here a face saving face like if you want to save face ever hear that term in arabic we say like if like how does he have the face to come to my house um, face-based cultures are going to be the far east they, they're, they're very much into that so it's all about saving face so meaning they someone from that culture may not want to tell you their problems in order to not burden you with their problems so then you won't look at them any differently so it's a very conf very uh, difficult culture to um, uh, navigate if you are purely from a western mindset I'll give you an example of each one of these so honor and shame we discussed it we kind of understand uh, dignity and guilt. So dignity and guilt cultures tend to not have a lot of a focus on family name or honor and shame. Uh, I discussed the Netherlands and, and, and even American society to a large extent. And what's interesting is uh, uh, Islam uses both of these models to get to us, which is I think why it's so universal of a, of a religion. Because it uses honor and shame when it comes to the day of judgment and you're having your face be, you know, looking all different colors and very embarrassed and uh, you'll be standing in front of everybody and accountable for yourself. But it also uses dignity and guilt, um, such as your personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, your own night, you know, praying at night and all these types of things that should be done in private. Um, so it uses both. Um, I'm gonna give you an example of face-based culture because this is interesting because it also exists in many of our communities as well we are more honor and shame but we have a lot of face aspects to our culture so i was uh, on a rotation back in virginia when i was doing residency and uh, i showed up to the hospital uh, I, I was doing it at a state hospital and the state hospital was kind of dingy so i didn't dress up very nice i just dressed up in a regular shirt and no tie and i was working with a korean doctor so the korean doctor tells me um you know, let's do bow tie Tuesday tomorrow. You know, okay. So the business bow tie, put on the bow tie for Tuesday. Then Wednesday I go without a tie again. He's like, let's do bow tie Friday. So do you understand what he's doing here? He's trying to tell me you need to be wearing a tie, but he doesn't want to um, sabotage my face or my standing in front of him, and he doesn't want to feel bad about it. So he does it in this way, and I'm just supposed to kind of figure out what he means, right? Which is fine. He's a really nice guy. I mean, he's one of he's a great guy. But that's the interest. That's how intricate culture can get. And if we're so fo you know, so so, uh, and we do that as uh, I think a lot of people from our communities do 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 certain things like that, where we're not we're not too, we don't want to be too direct because we don't want to hurt the other person. And then there's fear-based culture. That's that's a separate thing. That's uh, irrelevant to this discussion. Okay, so acculturation continued. So. Many of us are coming from an honor and shame background, at least our families are, our parents, and we are acculturating into a dignity and guilt-based culture, okay? So acculturation can go one of four ways. So assimilation, anyone know what assimilation is? Give up yours and adopt the other. Integration, yes. You identify with both, okay? And then there's separation, what's that? Separation is where you separate from the host culture and just go into an ethnic enclave and just don't deal with the new culture, okay? And then there's marginalization where you don't interact with either yours or the new culture and you kind of become marginalized. When I think of separation, I think of like my grandmother, Allah Hama. You know, she came to uh, the U.S., went to Dearborn, and just kind of kept her same lifestyle. And that's not bad. There's, uh, you know, it's not bad for someone uh, to do that if they're of a certain age and things like that. Now, it would be kind of weird for, for someone my age or someone who wants to go into uh, get a job or things like that. But, you know, she came here when she was in her late 50s, early 60s, and just kind of kept her same lifestyle. So she separated herself, okay? Marginalization, I think of... Um, 
there was uh, someone that I used to treat back in Virginia, and he was uh, from Iraq. And uh, he had to deal with uh, a lot of trauma. His family was, uh, you know, uh, executed, all of them, mom, dad, sister, everybody. And he came back home and found them gone. And so he ran away, was a refugee to the U.S. And he was a refugee to Virginia. All right. So here's somebody who now has a grudge against the ho his home culture, right? He doesn't really have anybody anymore there and has a grudge, too. And has this idealization of this new culture and this here in the, in the West, but is not interacting with it because he doesn't speak the language and doesn't know anybody. And there's very little people from his community in that city that, that we were at. So that's marginalization. This guy cannot accept either either way. And that's that's a lot of tension. Assimilation, you think of someone who just kind of forgets it all and just becomes like anybody else. And we've seen that with other communities. Uh, for example, um, you know, you think of the German community. For a while, they kept to their culture, and then eventually, now they're they're kind of just completely assimilated into the into America, or the Polish, or or the Italians, um, and some Arabs. Uh, you know, uh, and then there's integration where you take a little bit of both. So I would say, probably a lot of the second generation Muslims. Uh, who are born to immigrant families, because of course there's indigenous Muslims too, but the ones who are born to immigrant families are somewhere between assimilation and integration. Okay, And the, fam the, the parents are somewhere in between integration and separation. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Why is this uh, important? I just, it's not just facts, right? So, Identity. Identity. It's very important because it's our identity and our identity is shaped by culture, religion, and family. It's also very important uh, because this is an added tension that immigrant communities face that other communities may not face. Right? So this is an added tension that may contribute to what who, who said family dysfunction. <laughs> right? This is added tension that can contribute, and you see it a lot in private practice and in psychiatry, that the parents are thinking one way and the kids are thinking another way. So we need to work to find a way to understand this and bridge this so that we're all on the same page. Um, and we see that there's, it's very easy to manipulate a community with two very different ways of thinking and to uh, push uh, subtly the forces of assimilation onto a community. And I think we see that with activism. I don't need to get into too much detail, but we see how the activism is nowadays uh, of people who are uh, wearing hijab, or men who are named Muhammad and Ali um, are partaking in some type of activism that is very, very contradictory to Islamic teaching, to honor, to shame. People are saying, "Have no shame, have no, uh, have no, you know, do you, be you. Let's do, let's march, let's do this." And it's all like in these these very controversial um, arenas that that people are, are 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 doing. And especially, you see this in the universities in the social uh, departments, social uh, science departments. Um, you know, it's a very different curriculum now than in 2004 when I started undergrad with a lot of the intersectionality and, and these, 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 these postmodern uh, uh, ideas that have really infiltrated uh, hardcore into, into the curriculum. So I think we just need to be aware of where we're at, where we want to be, and then be steadfast in... In, in who we are, in our identity, and uh, know what's going on around us um, through education, through learning where we're at in the process of acculturation, through knowing where our parents are at. You know, one of the one of the patients uh, I treat, her mother came frantically to the office, um, very worried about what her daughter might have told me about what's going on, and I have to assure her that you know everything is private. There's nothing to worry about. But you could see that's that's that honor and shame. She's afraid that the daughter said something that might put the family in shame, while the daughter didn't really even consider that and just said things. So I had to work on bringing them to the same page. All right. Um, so when we talk about mental health and substance abuse, so who here lives in a large Islamic community? OK, the majority. Who doesn't? OK. Um, from the people that don't live in a large uh, Muslim community, um, what have, what are, what are your views? What what have what have you been hearing about substance abuse in in, in the Muslim community? Do you have any uh, you know thoughts about it? 
And that tells me that the, a lot of the activism that's, that's been going on has not been really that helpful because what they're doing is they're attacking the concept of honor and shame instead of using it to the benefit of the person. Because there's a way to use culture to the benefit. So that's one thing. Um, so the U.S. is in a crisis. You know, we all hear about the opiate epidemic, but it's actually coming to an end in the next couple of years. It's, it's on the way down now. Um, we know that. We know that in the Western states now there's a new crisis. It's uh, stimulants and meth and cocaine, and those are actually uh, superseding deaths from opiates, and opiates are actually coming down. So you know, we, we finish from one, we get another one. Um, and, the, and, and, and because the Muslims and Arabs are, uh, and I say Muslims and Arabs, I know there's a lot of non-Arab in here. I, I say that because that's a lot of my work is, is with, uh, my, a lot of my research has been on Arabs. So that's why I say the word Arab. I'm not trying to um, uh, keep anyone, uh, exclude anybody, no. Uh, I'm just very used to saying that because that's where my research is. But uh, you'd find that mental health and substance abuse, because it's a national crisis, we're also in this nation and we're part of the crisis. But it's not more or less than the rest of the country. So sometimes we get this perception that somehow we are so behind on everything and that the crisis is so much worse in our communities than in other communities, when in fact it's very similar. The statistics are very similar. Whether it's domestic violence, drug abuse, mental health, mental illness, they're very similar across cultures. That's something to keep in mind, just so that we don't start to fall into despair and think that everything we're doing is we're just failing. We're actually, our numbers are pretty similar to the rest of the country. That doesn't make it good. And it doesn't mean we don't need to discuss it. And it doesn't mean that we don't need to provide services, you know. But our numbers are, are pretty good. So you, you wouldn't get that if you were just listening to people talking, uh, activists talking. They'll, they'll make it sound like everything we're doing is just, you know, this horrible, horrible, horrible mess. Um, so it's a national epidemic. We have protective factors. We know that people who identify with their bicultural identification uh, have a lot of protective factors when it comes to mental health and physical health as well. And we know that you know, religion itself is a protective factor. Spirituality is a protective factor. Religion is even more of a protective factor. So there's people that say, I'm spiritual but not religious. That doesn't really protect you against, for example, suicide and overdose. Okay, but religions such as Islam, Catholicism, and uh, Orthodox Judaism, right? Those are actually protective factors when it comes to screening someone for suicidal uh, thoughts, right? So we don't need to remove religion from the topic. We need to actually tr kind of bring it in and try to integrate religion into the topic, not exclude it and say, you know, forget the halal and haram, let's just solve the problem. No, there's halal and there's haram, and there's a problem, and we need to solve it. But we can't hide behind the fact, but we cannot just say that, okay, well, let's forget the halal haram part, let's just solve the problem. No, the job of, I think, of, of, of the, the community and the religious scholars and people like that is to set the limits, to make sure they are talking about what's halal and haram. We, it's so important. I don't, I don't know how to stress enough that one of the most important protective factors in Islam is the fact that it says suicide is haram. That does not mean that I'm going to sit here and say someone who committed suicide is going here or there. That's not our job, and that I would never do that. But it is important to remember the prohibition, because that is one of the biggest protective factors that Islam offers in mental health, just like Catholicism, just like Orthodox Judaism. Does that mean, I, you know, I know that's a controversial thing to say, and again, I'm not saying anyone is going anywhere. <laughs> you know, What I'm saying is that is a protective factor, and we know it's a protective factor. And so we need to be reminded of that protective factor, not say, well, we're not sure or we don't know. We have to have a firm, um, unless we want to lose our protective factor and just become like some of the other Christian denominations and things like that that just no longer have any influence on mental health. Yes, our, our suicide rate is lower. Suicide rate amongst Muslims is lower, but the drug epidemic is not lower. And probably because there's a lack of services that's culturally appropriate, so people feel skeptical to go to someone who you know, a lot of uh, Muslim parents are always concerned to send their kids to a psychiatrist or a therapist because they might change the religion or they're not going to understand the culture. And those are things that, that, that are concerning to some people, and we shouldn't belittle their concerns. But there, so there's not enough culturally appropriate and competent care, right? But our suicide numbers in the Muslim world and in the U.S. are less than the rest of the country. But our drug use is the same, same. Absolutely. And like I said, we have an additional strain 
of integration and assimilation, all that stuff, that makes us more prone to these things. And I think we have to have not just cultural integration, but we need to have medical religious integration to some extent um, in that realm with substance abuse. But it is a protective factor when it comes to suicide. It is a protective factor when it comes to social support for people who actually uh, visit the, cent the mosques. And I think that pro if done properly and with true integration with 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 mental health and, and things like that, it could become a very, pro it, it will be a protective factor for uh, issues related to drugs and alcohol. Um, we do have less people who, 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 who drink than, than the, general, the general population. Our overdose death is the same when it comes to opiates. And we also have to think opiates um, are prescribed oftentimes because doctors were forced to prescribe them by uh, you know, accrediting agencies. They came and told us you have to prescribe opiates for pain and this was back when I was a resident. And um, So people think that that's not so wrong. So they would take the opiates, they get addicted and then eventually they find themselves in a big mess. It's very expensive to buy in the streets. No one's prescribing it anymore. They gotta go buy heroin and fentanyl. Fentanyl, you could overdose on it very quickly. And when we say fentanyl, we're not talking about fentanyl patches that we use for cancer patients. We're talking about this powder that's coming in from other uh, uh, other countries. Okay. So that's so these are all things that we have to consider when we say why our numbers are similar to the rest of America because our problems are similar to the rest of America as far as how much opiates were prescribed to our people. And there's a suspicion of using things like Suboxone um, in, in in the Arab and Muslim community. So Suboxone and Subutex and Zubzolv and all these things, these are medications to help people get off of opiates and sometimes you have to be on it for a few years. And so there's a suspicion, it's like we're replacing one addiction with another. That's not necessarily true because there's a plateau effect with, uh, with Suboxone, meaning if you take more, nothing will happen. And uh, it just, it's a partial, uh, partial agonist in the, in, in the, on the opiate receptors in the, in the mind and the brain and uh, much safer to do. So my, I t always tell people, my job is not to have the ideal solution, my job is to save lives. So uh, you know, so I do, use, I do prescribe Suboxone quite a bit to get people off of opiates so that they don't overdose and die. Um, and then we work on, the, on weaning them off later on, but the most important thing is to, so there's a lot of suspicion of that because, and, and they're right, people are right to be suspicious. It's, it's been a very difficult few years. But we also have to also shed light on the positives. Like I said, I don't like to just say all the negatives about our community and our people. We have to shed light on the positives. We tend to have strong, strong family units. We tend to have um, good support network if, if we're regular attendees to the mosque or have some type of, you know, not, I'm not saying you have to always go to be at the mosque. I'm saying that if you have that connection, there is a strong social support. You know, some of my best friends are people that uh, are Muslim. I mean, it just, it, 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 it creates this homogeneity. And yes, diversity is a good thing, but so is homogeneity to some extent. When we're surrounded by people that are similar to us in religion and faith, that's also a very powerful thing that gets people motivated and moving. I think one of the big problems is not on, parents and children are speaking different languages. Okay, so they're coming, they're, they're, they're just, there's nobody who's speaking to us. There's no one advocating for us in the activist sphere. Everyone who's, be, who's an activist that I've seen lately is just kind of making us more separate and separate and separate. Nobody is coming to tell us, well, here's what your mom is, here's what parents are thinking, here's what children are thinking, and let's bridge the gap. So I think there's a miscommunication. And there's a, uh, you know, if someone, if a mother is not born here or does not speak uh, fluent English or does not know what apps their kids are downloading or who, it's, it's very difficult. And I don't want to, and, and that's why I don't blame parents. And I don't blame, I blame the entire, you know, the, the, the entire, you know, Zhao that we're in, um, that there's nobody here to really help us connect the language of mother and, and, and sorry? I think it's, it's a job that we need to discuss with our ulama. I think uh, advocates, people like myself, it's, our, it's my responsibility in the clinic to make sure that people are, are, are speaking the same language. Um, and I really, really think that our ulama uh, must take classes or, or go to seminars talk about acculturation and really understand this concept. It is so important. And uh, I know they're so busy, but they really have to learn this and understand this so that they can tackle the problems that we're facing, whether it's um, activists telling us that everything we have is backwards, which is not true, to our kids uh, maybe getting into the wrong crowd without us knowing under our nose, to 
difference differences in um, value systems between parents and children they need to know this stuff it is so important and that's not to blame them I'm not blaming them I'm saying they're very busy and and, and this is new you know uh, we never really I don't think a lot of people recognize that this was the problem right yes oh what alaikum come Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so I just want to ask, um, are these religious protective factors expected to be implemented personally or um, are they now beginning to be implemented in public services such as in your clinic? Because I have seen like, I think it was in Pakistan and some other countries where they like implemented Surah Rahman uh, by Abdul Basit, recited by Abdul Basit as a, they did a research study to lower like rates of depression and whatnot. But are these like, um, are these personal religious, are these religious, uh, basically, uh, the religious treatments, are they being implemented in, in public services, or are they only expected to be implemented in the, individually by the person? Um, not that I know of. I don't know of any, any public promotion of that. Actually, I see the opposite. That, uh, you know, they asked some people who had addiction problems, what are the most important uh, factors for you? And they all said family, relationship with God, and friends. Then they asked, you know, some nurses and uh, and physicians, what are the most important things facing people with addiction? Public services, community mental health, you know, this, this, this. So you could see even a disconnect there. They're telling us what the problem is, but it's very hard for us to implement it. Um, what was what was the rest of what you said? Sorry. I was I was asking if the, like such really, I know like I don't. I don't foresee any appropriate way of telling a person like to implement religious things like uh, suicide being haram or not doing opioids um, in a clinic. So I kind of see that it's kind of difficult to implement. Not necessarily. So in a clinic, I don't uh, telling someone opiates is haram is not going to solve anything. It, it just won't. Not right now. Not in this crisis. But the suicide one will. And so what I do is I ask them what role does religion play in their life. And depending on the answer that they give me, I give them the appropriate counseling. But I don't tell them any of my personal opinions until they tell me what role the religion plays in their life. It's not my job to preach um, in my clinic, but it is my job to see what role the religion plays and then use that to the benefit of the patient. Yes. Wa alaikum as salam. Your advice doesn't necessarily have to be um, religious. Now, let's say you have a family member or a good friend of yours that is actually on drugs, taking any kind of uh, addiction medication or could be illegal drugs. What would be your advice um, on handling something like that? If you are a good friend of theirs or if it's a family member, would you suggest uh, staying away or would you suggest maybe you know um, getting them some kind of help? and not ruining the friendship or ruining the brotherhood or sister or whatever relationship you have with that person? I would, uh, I, I, uh, um, once someone has an addiction and tolerance and things like that, abstinence becomes very difficult. So abstinence-based programs that tell you don't use anything and just be strong are only successful about 8, per, eight to 9% of the time. Um, Medication-assisted treatments are successful about 45 to 55% of the time, depending on the medication. So I would always recommend that they seek proper medical help uh, if, if it's appropriate, if it's available. And it should be a, a clinic that's not just a pill mill or just like, you know, pay me and I'll give you this about. So it should be someone who gives, who, who, who cares, right? Um, so depending on the community that you're in, you can talk to me afterwards. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Um, I have a question. I'm, I'm working in the medical field, um, but I have a question always when I see a patient, uh, when I ask the question, do you use any drug? They tell me yeah, I'm using marijuana for pain. We have a nightmare in our community. I, I live in Michigan. We know that marijuana now is legal and people use it. What do you consider people who, who use marijuana addicts or addicts on this? Or, I mean, when we talk about mental health and substances abuse, there's a different substances that we now we know about it. Yeah, so marijuana is uh, physically and psychologically uh, addicting. It could cause dependence. We know that. That's the fact. Um, it is very psychoactive, more so than many other medications. 
For example, from my understanding, opiates don't cause increase in schizophrenia. Marijuana does, especially in a developing mind. So if you're in between the ages of, you know, 15 and 25, and you're using marijuana, uh, you're gonna you're putting yourself at a very high risk of developing schizophrenia. And I have seen an influx of that in my clinic with people using the high THC uh, oils. They do the vaping oils, and you know, um, the, the THC one, the one that's killing people is that, is that one. It's not the, it's not the, the regular one. And uh, I have seen uh, a lot of psych- uh, an increase in psychosis in young people that uh, doesn't make sense. It, it, that, that it just, it shouldn't be that much. And that's because people are, are using marijuana and they think it's very safe and that it's healthy because it's a herb, you know. Um, and the pro-marijuana lobby in Michigan was very, very strong. And it had actually a lot of Muslims and Arabs that were advocating for, for it as a safe and uh, wonderful substance. Um, and that's what I mean by activism, that people don't know what they're talking about. Uh, they end up creating a big mess. You know, I made the argument that we should be fighting to decriminalize marijuana, but not legalize it. Decriminalize means if you have it, you don't go to jail for it. But to legalize it means it's sold all over the place now and it's completely and culturally accepted. That's problematic. Um, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people were duped to support it. Um, and we're going to see r- r- ramifications of it. And we're going to see people having agitation because of it and increase in bipolar and psychosis and anxiety, right? And uh, marijuana helps with anxiety when you smoke it. But then after, you know, you get anxiety. <laughs> right? So. Um, just like, you know, stimulants help you focus, and then afterwards you feel like someone hit you with a sledgehammer in the morning, you can't get up. But yeah, while you took it, you were able to type fast and study and do good on your test. So similar with marijuana, yes, it can help some people with anxiety short term, but long term, no. There's also a difference between a 30-year-old, 40-year-old smoking marijuana occasionally, and someone who's 18, 15, right, while their limbic system is creating connections with the frontal lobe, that's the age where that's happening. So that's the age where we're learning how to have executive function over our emotions. And so our executive function is connecting to the limbic system, which is controls our basal desires and emotions. And uh, marijuana does, uh, does cause uh, a problem with the pruning and, and that process. So uh, it's a pretty a psychoactive substance. And I, 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 I you know, I think a lot of us were misinformed about what was going to happen. The marijuana epidemic in the metro Detroit area. I I wouldn't call it an epidemic yet, but okay. Yeah, I mean, it's getting really serious. Like, it's getting legal. So, I mean, like, around, you know, my little brother and my nephews. And, I mean, like, we know khalas, it's haram. Of course, of course. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, what do you think? Like, is this something that we take, like, extremely serious? Like, be very, very careful? Or is it something, like, not as serious as, obviously, cocaine or the opioids you're talking about? but is more or less serious as the mar- as marijuana. I think we have to take it seriously. I think we need to be mindful of what, you know, uh, some people think that their kids may be just vaping and they're actually vaping THC oil, right? Um, I think we do need to take it seriously, but we can't turn back. Once something like this is passed, you can't go backwards. That's the, that's the bad part, is you cannot go and make it, you can't say, okay, well, let's decriminalize it and keep it illegal. We can't do that anymore because they only gave us two options on the ballot, legal or illegal. They didn't give us a third moderate, normal, sane option. And they never do, you know, uh, because the people who are campaigning tend to be on the fringes and radical. And so they, they, they're they the ones that are getting the, the surveys done and they're getting things on the ballot. And then people who are moderate and reasonable and rational were not really out there protesting. We want moderate solutions to our problems. Um, and maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe we need to call call out people a little bit more, some of the activists, some of the people with... Muslim sounding names that are saying non-Muslim things um, on the pulpits, right? So it's different to be, to have uh, uh, a difficult relationship with religion privately and go back and forth with it and things like that. But w- but these public figures have really, I think, done a number on, on, on the community, the, the public figures, by speaking so loudly in favor of these things. Yes. So can you uh, speak to statistics on science, you know, psychiatrists? And medications, how no, how successful are they in helping patients? So medication assisted treatment for addiction is yeah. forty five to fifty five percent effective. Without it, it's about eight percent, ten, nine percent. 
Um, for depression, SSRIs with therapy, 66% effective. Therapy alone, 33% placebo, around 20 or 30%. Uh, psycho bipolar, very, very well treated if you treat it early on with medications. Bipolar is not something you can treat th through therapy. Um, some people, I have people that shadow me in the clinic who are telling me, you know, I bet, you know, you should be able to do therapy with everybody until they saw someone who was actively manic, who was going to light himself on fire. Uh, and then I told them, that's bipolar. Do you want to do therapy with him? Um, so these things are, uh, they are, the treatment is there and it is effective. Um, psychosis, same thing. You can't really do therapy with someone who's um, schizophrenic, delusional, disorganized, and not making any sense. Uh, they don't have the cognitive capacity at that time for therapy. Now, you could do simple behavior modification and things like that, but really, at the end of the day, a lot of times, it does require a mix of both, and it requires psychopharmacology. Uh, okay? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so we hear often about uh, marijuana being used medically as treatment. Uh, so what's the reality of that? And then also you mentioned that marijuana is uh, addictive. Um, so how do we balance, for example, um, certain uh, health professionals uh, prescribing marijuana um, uh, for certain diseases uh, versus its addictive nature? And I think that kind of goes back to what you were talking about uh, too with opioids and um, them prescribing uh, opioids, uh, even though they're... Um, yeah, I mean, of course, the things are addicting and sometimes you need it. You're not gonna tell a cancer patient who's dying, you know, uh, and in pain, you're, I'm not gonna give you opiates because you'll be addicted, that's silly, right? Yeah. Um, with marijuana, the, uh, it's only approved for like three things and I forget what they are. I think epilepsy might be one of them. Something about fibrom. I, I don't. I, I don't want to say. Like I don't know. There's like three things that it's you know shown to, to work for, and yet people are taking it for like hundreds of things. So sometimes people run these practices where a doctor practices or nurse practitioners and and, and what have you, where you pay one hundred and fifty dollars and you get a marijuana card, right? So that's not medicine. I don't know what that is, but it's not medicine. Um, so yes, there's things that it may help. There's no problem in doing research and using it for someone where it may help. But when we're just, there's absolutely no evidence for half of the things or most of the things that they're using it for, that's a problem. That, then that's just an excuse to use it, right? I'm using it because I have headaches. I'm using it because I have this. I'm using it because my toe hurts. I'm using it because of, okay? I mean, just you're just using it to get high. And do what you got to do, but don't push on our kids. Haram. Yeah. Salam. I just want to make a quick comment regarding the legality of marijuana. It's very misunderstood. By federal law, marijuana is a class one narcotic, and it is not legal, period. Different states have different laws, but federal law, it's illegal, period. Yeah. Yeah, the states have their own sovereignty and things like that. But yeah, federally, you can't, you know cross the border with it and things like that. Thank you uh, for that uh, the talk. And I, I think this is a very important topic and one topic that's pushed under the rug, especially within our community. Um, and just to share my own experience, it's unfortunate how many Muslim parents I've looked into their own eyes and told them that your son or your daughter was a drug addict and we have to now withdraw care um, because of an overdose, whether it be cocaine, um, heroin, and many other things, and opioids. This is a real thing, and I, I think the, the major issue, and, and this has just been my experience, I'm not, by no means, I'm not, I'm not a psychiatrist, but this has been my experience, is this, gener this, this upcoming generation, yes, we are, we're very busy, um, and there's this perception that we have to be perfect, um, and coping mechanisms are, are lacking. I, I think many people need to understand that it's okay to fail. Um, and to go through hardship, you know, you know, Ma'am Sadiq always says this famous hadith that said, hardship brings worship. Um, and I, I don't think coping mechanisms and how to cope with sadness or how to cope with hardship or how to cope through difficulties is really stressed. Because um, eventually it will lead to substance mm -hmm. abuse. This all leads to substance abuse. And a lot of the suicides in my experience that I've seen have always been just sort of, um, they're irrational and they're impulsive, especially yeah. in the young generation. Yeah. That's been my experience. Um, and 
I, I would like your, your thoughts and, and the other thing is, is, is this, do you think from our community standpoint, if we were to educate our youth how to better cope with situations, would this have any Im impact? Because from a community standpoint, we should be able to do something. I think um, Islam has a lot of good examples of coping. I mean, even the tragedy of Ashura itself is all about coping and uh, coping with God in mind, right? I think coping just from a humanistic perspective, I think that's what's happened is we've, we've really removed God and a greater purpose. When you don't have a greater purpose, I believe, when you don't have a bigger principle that you're living for, um, it's very difficult to really cause change. I think that the God picture really needs to be there. So if we can use our Aimma and Ahlul Bayt and Sitna Zainab in a, in a real way to help us cope with God in mind, um, that might be very wonderful. Because we have to understand the suicide rate is skyrocketing across the United States um, and, I, and, and uh, amongst the, the millennials and centennials. Um, so and, and they teach coping at schools and all this stuff and it's not doing anything. I think we have to have a higher principle that we're living for. It's very important, in my opinion. That's my Islamic, that's like my opinion, that's, that's my psychiatric opinion per se. But. Assalamu alaikum. I just wanted to, it's more like a comment, not like a, a question, but I wanted to thank you for taking the time to discuss this topic because I feel, I feel like it's a well-needed uh, topic that's not discussed enough. And uh, I just want to make a comment on what you said before when you were talking about the role of spirituality and religiosity uh, as a kind of like a, like a protective factor in terms of suicide rates. I was also, I just wanted to add something to that. I came across a, a study while I was in my undergraduate studies and it was, um, it measured religiosity and perceived stress, and it just said that uh, those who perceived themselves as more religious or more uh, had something to hold on to perceived their stress as lower compared to those that um, did not have something to hold on to as well. So. The idea of a higher principle is very, very important. I agree. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I was going to ask, uh, what is your take on multivitamins and nutritional, uh, I guess, uh, supplements? Have you ever seen any extreme case of uh, addiction or dependency about uh, multivitamins uh, and nutritional supplements? Maybe psychologically people just start taking like 17 vitamins in the morning and, you know, but they're not, they, they don't, they just go through you. They're, they're, they're not doing anything unless you specifically for a reason there's a deficiency or for example, an acetylcysteine, you're using it for OCD or trichotillomania that can help. Um, you know, so there's different vitamins that you can use for different things, but uh yeah, there's people that are into that fitness culture that that's probably more along the lines of some type of OCD or something that's going on or body dysmorphia or, you know. Uh, 